Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. And today we have Joel Rubinoff. Joel's been a reporter and journalist uh, for 30 years, uh, most of that time with the Waterloo Region Record. Joel chats with us about journalism, life, and some of the more and less memorable moments in his three decades of interviewing celebrities. I've been reading his work for over 20 years, and I'm really looking forward to sitting down and actually talking to him for a bit. Here he is, Joel Rubinoff. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond, Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Do you enjoy Bond Park Podcast? If so, we would really appreciate it if you leave a review, like, rate, subscribe, but most importantly, share directly from the platforms with your family and friends. That's the best way to get the word out to everybody and more people will get to see our show that way. So click those like buttons and share our show. Thank you. Thanks. (laughs) On with the show. This is it. Bond Park is supported by Elite Training Facility. We are supported by Elite Training Facility. With over 30 years experience, Elite Training Facility in Kitchener knows how to help you reach your fitness goals. They've got personal training, strength classes, registered massage therapy, and much more. Their facility has always been clean and spacious, and now the staff are taking even greater precautions to ensure the safety of all. Physical distancing, sanitizing, and safety protocols are all in place and respected by all. They pass their health and safety inspection, ensuring that they are following the latest guidance to prevent viral transmission. It is more important than ever for people to take care of themselves in mind and body. Elite Training Facility can help. They have the experience, knowledge, and personable touch to develop a fitness regime that is right for you. Pro athlete, beginner, or a senior, let Elite Training Facility sculpt a fitness program to target your specific needs. Elite Training Facility recently moved to a brand new, bigger and better location at 842 Victoria Street North in Kitchener. Find them at elitetrainingfacility.ca or follow them on Facebook and Instagram. We are supported by Spice of Life Gourmet Hot Sauce. They say variety is the spice of life. Well, we say Spice of Life has variety. These sauce gurus make their products in small batches with all natural ingredients, and you can taste the difference. If you're a brave spice lover, you can try their Million Plus Plus, their diabolical blend of scorpion and ghost peppers. Have milder taste? Their not-so-hot sauce is made with fresh jalapenos and goes perfect with pizza, nachos, and even in guacamole. And their holy smoked sauce has won awards for its habanero-based twist on a West Indian sauce. Find Spice of Life Gourmet Hot Sauce at Pharmasafe Waterloo Wellness Pharmacy and check out their products at spiceoflifeselections.com and on Instagram and Facebook. Bond Park is supported by Memma Foods International. Memma is proudly Canadian, but their products taste like they're fresh from Italy. There's a taste of Sicily in every Memma pasta sauce and soup, aptly named Just Sauce and Just Soup, along with other easy-to-prepare meals and specialty products. Made with fresh local ingredients and packaged in reusable glass jars, Memma's Just Soup will warm you right through, like their butternut squash and Chef Dev's world-inspired Italian sweet potato soup. Their hearty heat and serve just sauce line is made with simple ingredients and nothing else. From creamy tomato basil, marinara, and hot and spicy to roasted garlic, rosé, and four cheese. Find Memo Foods at your favorite grocery or specialty food stores like Vincenzo's or Brady's Meat and Deli. Check out their products at memma.ca and follow them on Instagram at Memo Foods International for all upcoming news and sales near you. Buen appetito! Rubinoff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great to be here. I'm interested in how you and Marshall met. Who's going to tell it first? Uh, well, I had to think about this for a minute, and I think it probably was 1999 when I was the artist in residence for the city of Kitchener. And Joel's written several really great stories about my art over the years. Might have been the Millennium Thumbprints project he wrote about, or it might have been me being the artist in residence. I can't remember exactly, but I just figured out that I think I've known Joel for about maybe 21 or 22 years now. I think it was longer than that because I remember coming to an art class you were teaching with a nude model and there was some 
issue around that that had warranted media attention. I can't remember if this. You might remember. I don't remember exactly what the issue was. But oh, right. You know what it was? Was that uh, you came to Wilfrid Laurier when I was teaching life drawing to right. university students. And we had Georgina Brown, a, a really well-known life model in the area. And uh, she dressed up as a dominatrix. That's right. Yeah. And uh, there were lots of letters to the editor that said, this is not appropriate at all in a university and all that. But uh, Georgina did role playing. Like sometimes she dressed up like Little Miss Muffin and had all sorts of different outfits. And uh, in life drawing, once in a while, we uh, we have the model put on some kind of really cool outfit and draw that. And that's all she was doing. But boy, there was a lot of people are so funny upset about it. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not my first choice of outfit, but it doesn't even strike me as being odd. It's art. You're learning how to draw something different. Why would you? Why would it even be an issue? How was did, this 20 years ago, though? I don't know. Yeah. Was it 20 years ago or more? More than that? Oh, more. Know. You were thinking it was longer. Yeah, right? I, I don't remember when that was exactly, but yeah. And how did I get there? Do you, do you like there was some like we must have known ahead of time that there was going to be some controversy or? Yeah, well, I think we we're also trying to figure out how to photograph. I think David David Beebe photographed it, longtime right. record photographer. And we're trying to figure out how to photograph a nude model. And I know there's certain ways to do that anyways, but Georgina made it easy and just said, I'm going to dress up for this one. So mm-hmm. congrats on your recent award. Uh, you won an Ontario yeah. newspaper award for column writing and a couple runners up. Tell us about that. Thank you. Without sounding self-serving, I'm not sure that I can because it's, uh, you know, I mean, I'm I'm happy to have any kind of recognition, whether it's from my mother's best friend, you know, sending me an email or whatever. Um, you know, journalism is is having a tough time right now, so it's always nice to get a pat on the back. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say about that without... Uh, I think, you know, we all journalists have egos. So, that, you know, it certainly plays into that, which is, you know, kind of keeps you motivated, I guess. And uh, well, without ego, there's no perspective to write from, right? Then this podcast is about you. So self-serve. We want to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll get you started on this. Yeah, so, Joel, so your writing, I've always thought, uh, is outstanding. And in the same way that you can tell a Matt McCarthy photograph from, you know, yeah. the second you see it. You can tell a Joel Rubinoff story. Um, you have a certain style and craft and beautiful rhythm. And um, it's always entertaining. And I, I don't know how you do it. I, um, I have no idea. But somewhere along the way, you learned how to really carve out a space for yourself that is distinctly Joel Rubinoff. And you must have just an incredible love for words and piecing a big story together. Oh, thanks for saying that. I mean, you know, I, what... I think everybody has their thing, you know, and this, I guess, writing was always my thing. It wasn't like I was good at anything else, particularly. I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a computer nerd. I wasn't a science geek. I didn't, wasn't particularly popular in high school. It just, I had this kind of ability that I could just kind of get attention through the way I phrased things. <laughs> and, um, I figure that out pretty early and I just kind of rode the wave, you know, I think everybody does that. You figure out the thing that you, you have a natural aptitude for and you just, just stick to it. I mean, so how early are we talking about? Like, were you a kid? Like you- um, in grade 11, I wrote an advice column where I would make up the questions and then I would answer <laughs> them in a really mocking, sarcastic tone. Somehow this was a big hit. The funny thing about that experience was that I remember the, um, the editors of the school paper who are probably, I was in grade 11, they were probably in grade 12 or 13 saying, you know, this, this kid, this kid could really draw the youth demographic. And I thought that was funny. I, it stuck in my head all these years because every job I've had since then, everybody's always said the same thing to me. I think you could really draw the youth demographic. <laughs> and now I'm like 60 years old and, you know, no one's actually said that to me recently, but it's, it's been an ongoing thing. Yes. the youth. Dem- and usually what happens when, when I, I actually get into whatever it is and I start writing is it usually doesn't necessarily draw the youth demographic, but it really pisses off the older demographic. And then, you know, so it's kind of ironic in that respect, but um, yeah, I always take it as a compliment. So I'm happy to go with the flow, but yeah. I, gonna... I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. The other thing I would do is I was on the yearbook committee in high school and people would send in their, um, their grad write-ups. I don't know if they still do that or, you know, um, but people would answer some questions and then the yearbook committee staff would take them and write them into witty little essays. So I would just kind of take them and I punch them up a bit and I'd make up stuff and I, and I would do, you know, it was wildly inappropriate. I would have been fired if it had been a paying job, but um, 
yeah, I, that's I guess, <laughs> the, that that's kind of the you know it was just silly stuff. And then if I can say one more thing, I went to um, I went to Western uh, um, to study English, actually to study phys ed, which was a big mistake because I'm not athletic in any way, shape, or form. And then that kind of led to a default degree in English, and that led to a default thing where I would go out, hang around the student newspaper um, eighteen or twenty hours a day. And, um, you know, it, I just kind of fell in with a gang of lovable, dysfunctional misfits, and I felt right at home. And we all had these grossly inflated egos. We thought, you know, we were running the world, man. We were just, and we, and the paper would come out twice a week, and we walk around um, looking at, watching over people's shoulders as they read the paper to see if they were reading our stories. And it would, this was a thrill every Tuesday and every Friday. And we just thought, you know, when you're in university or in an enclosed environment like that, you get a sense, an exaggerated sense of, of your own importance. And we all, we just were convinced that, you know, we were, we were writing the book on this stuff. So I think it served me well. I mean, it makes me somewhat impossible to deal with as a, as a, as a reporter, but I think it, as a writer, I think it was valuable because it, you know, we all had this, because when you get in the real world, of course, people don't actually treat you that way. And, and so it, it, if you have that foundation of, of even overconfidence, but maybe I'll just say confidence, I think it can, it, it kind of serves as somewhat of a ballast against um, the, all the other stuff that comes your way. I've always been wowed by how you can <laughs> turn uh, lemons into lemonade. I'll, I'll, the be, one of the best <laughs> examples I can think of is you interviewed Brian Wilson with the Beach Boys. And I don't know what you were thinking during the interview or right after the interview. I don't know if you thought, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with this? But you turned that into an incredible feature. Um, can you take us back to that story interviewing Brian Wilson over the phone? I guess before he probably played at Center Square and how you managed to pull a really great story out of, a, out of, a, out of an interview that just was not good. Oh, well, thanks for saying that. Brian Wilson's an interesting guy um, because he, you know, he's had a series of... Um, I guess mental health issues over the years. And I, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I mean, it's pretty well documented and um, it's great that he's still alive and he's still got that musical aptitude. But when you talk to him, it's a slightly altered reality where he answers questions at rapid fire pace, really fast with no breaks between. And he also answers them in, in, um, in like, like sometimes one word sentences or, like a string of words really fast. And then there'll be this awkward silence after every question. So it's, it's, it's an unusual thing, but what I have found repeatedly with, because there's, there's lots of people where you interview them and they don't, they don't perform to specs. Like they don't, they don't sit up and behave and, and follow direction. Well, what I find as a writer that serves has always served me well is the power of observation. Um, kind of picking up on the nuances, the subtleties, the emotional subtext, what are they, what's really going on here? What, you know, what's described the feeling of interviewing this person. And I find when there's context like that, you can kind of turn any, any interview into something meaningful if you can kind of give context. So I think that's one thing journalists um, should always strive for. It doesn't always happen, but um, I think really it's, it's about context. So in Brian Wilson's case, yeah, I kind of vaguely remember that he was, it, it was all a bunch of um, non sequiturs and, 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 you know, four, four word answers to complex questions. <laughs> and uh, I forget what I did, but I think I just tried to convey a sense of his personality. I mean, the truth is he's a musical genius and I res totally respect that. So I think if you're coming from a place of respect, um, you know, but I mean, I've interviewed people like Meatloaf, you know, um, we all know who Meat Meatloaf is. Um, where, you know, he's kind of a pompous guy and, and he, he's not really, he's not going to cooperate. And it's not, it's hard to come from a place of respect. So what I would try to do with people like that is just kind of capture their personality without being mean spirited, but, you know, present them as they are. So how, how they are is they're in his case, he was slightly obnoxious and, and um, tell me how great his album is and he blathering on about it. And then, if I try to interject with a question, he shuts me down. I mean, that stuff makes great reading when you're reading it in it. If you can write it into a story, I think um, what I, that's what I've tried to do as a writer is trying to capture those nuances, kind of give the context because 
if you're just writing down what people say, it's really boring because rock stars and movie stars and TV stars are not inherently interesting people in terms of, of back and forth conversations. They've been media coached. They have certain ways of answering. They've asked, they've been asked every question anyone could ever think they have been asked a million times. So whatever they give you is stuff that they've already said a million times, their eyes are glazing over. Some of them are real characters and will come alive in the moment, but it's pretty rare. I've found usually you're getting stock answers, but if you can just use the powers of observation, like um, for example, like I don't want to go into too much off tangent here, but like, you know, like Callista Flockhart who played Allie McBeal, I used to attend every year the um, TV critics conference when I was reviewing TV shows for the record. Um, every summer they'd send me for two weeks to a posh Beverly Hills hotel with all the other TV critics. And we would inter interview all the stars for the upcoming TV season. And there were certain characters that just stood out. And Callista Flockhart was interesting because she clearly did not want to interact with the press in any way, shape, or form. But these people are under contract that promote their show and they have no choice. So they have these kind of, they call them star parties. Like NBC has a party for the cat for the casts of all its different shows and all the journalists, all the TV critics are invited. And it's up to us as, as TV critics to kind of core these people. It's like the Hunger Games, right? They're trying to get away from us in an enclosed space, but they're obligated to be there and talk to us. And we're trying to hunt them down. So it was funny because I noticed Calista Flockhart hovering by the entrance the whole night, trying to be as inconspicuous as possible, hoping no one would notice her. And, um, you know, I eventually worked up the nerve because these people are intimidating, a lot of them. And I, and, I, and, I, and I asked her my, you know, my rote questioning about whatever the show was. I think it was called Brothers and Sisters. This is probably like 12 years ago. And, um, you know, she gave me her carefully rehearsed media coached answers. But what was really interesting was the way she was like, she, she had this kind of jittery, nervous quality. And she was always looking over her shoulder and she was really you know, didn't want to be, you could tell. So I kind of wrote that into the story. And I mean, that was the story. It made it very, it, it just made it, when you can convey a sense of the personality, I think it really helps um, make things interesting. And I don't, I don't honestly see a lot of that. I think, I think, you know, it's tough to find in this day and age um, of Twitter and quick hits and everything. It's, it's tough to, um, to find, you know, people that will take the time to do that. So well, I remember feeling that when I read a story many years ago that you wrote about Tony Bennett. And I feel like I learned more about Tony Bennett through your story. You know, it's funny because there's so many people over the years and they all kind of blur together. But there's certain things that stand out. Can I tell you an anecdote about Rain Wilson from The Office, the yes. TV show The Office? I'm going to interject and say this is how you and I just met. We met on Twitter, what, yesterday? <laughs> yes, yes. You you threw out an, an Office um, reference, which was with what's going on here, is anybody going to miss office culture? And I'm like, well, I've got some things to say. I'm going to email Joel right now that's and right, introduce that's myself. Right. That's funny. And the that's answer funny. is no, I'm not going to miss office culture. That's, that's funny. Yeah, I just, you know, I was, I'm just doing something about the, um, just because, you know, everyone's working from home now. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like an interesting. But um, so at one of these, at one of these um, TV conventions in Los Angeles, so what happens is the critics, we're all we're, the celebrities are walking around with their handlers. They're trying to avoid the press, but they have to be there. They have no choice. The press are kind of intimidated and nervous, but they're doing their jobs. And we have to ask these people these questions. And, you know, every so often, everybody kind of just retreats to their little corners to recover. So I'm sitting at this table with a bunch of other cynical critics. And we're going, ah, you know, these celebrities, what a bunch of a-holes. And, you know, this is such a hassle. And and, you know, they're all egotistical and, and everyone's agreeing. And there's this guy in the middle and he's agreeing with us and, and I don't recognize him or anything. And, um, you know, he looks just like another critic because all, all critics have similar qualities. They're all kind of bookish, like, I, like print, like TV is a different animal, but these are print critics. So, you know, we, we're all analytical and we're all like, you know, kind of slightly introverted. And probably we all got beat up in high school. I didn't, I didn't do a formal survey on that one, but I'm going to take a wild guess. But there's this guy, this kind of nerdy guy in the middle, and um, he's kind of agreeing. And there's no reason to suspect that, he, that anything unusual. Turns out it's Rain Wilson <laughs> from the office. And um, he just was masquerading as a critic. And, um, but he was a really good guy. He was really down to earth. And he's probably the only celebrity I've talked to, or one of the few, that you could just talk to him like a regular person. And he would just 
you know, be honest back. And he didn't have this kind of pretentious air of, you know, you know, I'm a celebrity and you're not. And uh, yeah, he, he remembered me a year later, which is highly unusual because any, any celebrity you talk to is, is also talking to in that environment, like 200 other TV critics that look like you and are asking the same questions. The odds of them remembering you even 10 minutes later are infinitesimally low. So, you know, because this guy actually made a, I was able to bond with him because he was very down to earth. A year later, he actually remembered who I was, which was quite shocking um, because that never happened. Equally as compelling as like a story on, let's say, looking back at Led Zeppelin at Kitchen Auditorium or some big rock and roll story, you're right. I equally have really enjoyed your stories about your family. And uh, when you became a parent and decided to dive in and share kind of all the ups and downs of raising kids. Uh, how did you approach that at first? Did you kind of really think that through and how, how you want? I, I think those are really big, successful stories you've written over the years. I came to parenting quite late. I had my first, I didn't get married till I was 47. I had my first kid at 48, second kid at 50. I mean, that's pretty late in the game. And, and, I, and if, any, if you talk to anybody who knew me before then, they would have told you, this is honest, like they would have said, this guy will never get married. He'll be single his whole life and he will never have kids. And I would have said that uh, that was, it, it was a complete left turn, unexpected out of the blue. No one would have ever predicted. And it does happen. I mean, I'm sure it happens to other people as well. But this is the part of the story I want to hear. How did this happen then? I don't know. I, you know, this is a whole <laughs> sorted dating thing, <laughs> shy, introverted person trying to navigate the dating world and, and, not being very successful and, and just getting burned out with, you know, first dates that were like job interviews. I found once you get into your thirties and you're, you're dating, it's, it's very much of a, it's almost like a job interview because if you're dating people that are single and never married, which I was, there's a, there's a biological clock issue that comes up on the first or second date. And if your commitment shy as I was, um, you know, that kind of shuts it down right, right there. So this was just an ab aborted series of, of unsuccessful first and second dates. Um, and, and I actually met my, my wife um, through um, a story I was writing about. I was, I was the TV critic at the time, and I was trying to get a bunch of teenagers together to comment on the fall's new series. And I'm not going to go into the whole backstory because it's going to take a, it's going to take the whole podcast. But basically, her dad, who was the dean of arts at University of Waterloo, had written a letter to the editor about the TV show Survivor, and I and we thought it was amusing that dean of arts watched Survivor. So I called him up and I did a story, and he said, "Well, you know, you know who's really a big fan is my daughter," and he put her on the phone, and I and she she was a psychologist, and I talked to her. And then four years went by and I, I never met her. And then I had her in mind. We communicated by email back and forth about Degrassi, the next generation, Degrassi Junior High. And um, when, and so I had her in mind as somebody who might know, because I knew that she had teenage babysitters and maybe they had some friends and maybe she could host something. And then I could just interview them because I didn't know how to get access teenagers to watch TV shows, you know. Um, so I could interview them about them. So she offered, yeah, she graciously offered to do that. And then that's how we met. And then, um, yeah, that, and then we just liked each other. We just liked each other. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and the, and the rain, the clear arrangement was like, I, I was very clear, um, that, you know, the, like when it was clear that we were, is going to be serious and we're going to get married. We, we had, I, I, I had my list of demands. I said, well, you know, the only way I could possibly do this as a, as a lifelong bachelor and, and, and um, you know, obsessive compulsive OCD person is to, is to have an agreement right now that we're not going to have any kids. And she agreed and we had a deal and um, cause she already had two kids. They're, they're my, my two stepkids. And I thought, well, this, this kind of checks all the boxes. She already has kids. So I won't have any, there won't be any pressure on me to have kids. And that's great. Cause I don't want any kids. So then so then that we, it was great. We agreed and we got married. And then next thing I know, I'm, I have two kids, like two kids and then two more kids. <laughs> like we had two kids together. So, um, all the best yeah. laid plans, right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's a good thing. I actually, turns out I like kids. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't really aware of that, but I mean, apparently 
other people have been aware because they've seen me with my nieces and nephews and I come from a big family and they, they got the vibe that even though I say I don't like kids, I'm, I'm actually good with kids. And mm-hmm. so that turned out to be correct, I guess. And I'm lucky for me because now I got two of them plus two stepkids. <laughs> so, okay, well, let's take one minute to uh, introduce <laughs> your wife's name. What is your wife's name after all this talk of her? Oh, Alicia. Alicia. Well, thank you, Alicia, for marrying this great writer in our city. <laughs> yeah. So the back to Marshall's question, which was that, where do you find that well and that perspective to write about family life? Oh, there's I'm glad such you asked. Articles. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I mean, I come from a, I, being Jewish, I come from a culture, it's a bit of a stereotype, but I think it's true in my case. It, it's a culture of, you know, there's no standing on ceremony. There's no kind of artificial politeness. It's just, you know, you just say what's on your mind. And that that's what I grew up with. It, just how what I'm comfortable with. And that's always served me well in my writing as well. I, I don't beat around the bush. I just, whatever the truth is, it just comes out somehow. So, I mean, that's always been the way that I've approached anything I've written. And with kids, it was no different. And I just, um, you know, and I, I just, there's a certain element of humor from a distance when, when you have little kids, I mean, you know, when you're in the middle of it, it's not necessarily humorous. <laughs> I don't, I mean, Marshall, I know you have kids. I don't know if you do Sarah, but. I do but two I, teenage daughters. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so, I mean, you can look back and laugh. It's, it's hard to do that in the moment, but I found the writing very therapeutic because in the middle of this chaos, and it was just absolute chaos because they're, they're pretty close together. They're 19 months apart. And um, my older son has autism. And that was a set of challenges early on that, again, added another layer of, you know, excitement, let's say, <laughs> to, the, to the whole child rearing process. I mean, you know, you either you just you have to embrace it. You don't have a choice. You, what are you going to do? Hide under the couch? So I just I found it. It helped me um, to write about it in a semi humorous way. Like try, there's, you know, try to see the humor in it and and try to bring out that the the you know, also there's a lot of poignancy in some of the situations. So I just try to capture whatever is going on. I, I mean, I think as a writer, I think it served me well just to not be holding back anything. So that's always been my, that's just always been how I've been. Like that's how I am in person too. I don't, I don't have a filter. Other people have filters. I don't, I don't have a filter. So it's not always a positive thing, but I think when you're writing, it's a positive thing because you can go back and edit it. If there's something inappropriate, you can take it out. So Joel, people, uh, people respond, they respond to emotion. They respond to truth. Mm-hmm. I've always found that. Um, and I always respond to that in, in things when I'm reading by other people, like, you know, like no bullshit, that's gotta be the the mantra or what's the point. So we were corresponding earlier today by email, just back and forth, some breezy chit chat. And uh, you talk podcast you're, when? <laughs> yeah, you're talking about the the Good Doctor, the TV show, and I was saying to Joel how I've never seen that show, but those 30 second commercials are very compelling to me. Not just on TV, but when they come on the radio. Yeah. I, I guess that doctor's name is uh, Sean. Is that his name? Is his first name? Sean. Yeah, Doctor Sean. Yeah. yeah. And anyways, uh, no, and yeah. I, and uh, that that character is autistic. And uh, anyways, it it really pulls you in. You know, like you feel like without ever seeing the show, I can kind of see the growth in this kind of over the seasons of this character, just through commercials, basically. And Joel was telling me why he likes the show. And uh, anyways, everything that you've learned about autism, when you watch that show, The Doctor, what kind of links do you see between that character and that show and the stories they're trying to tell? And then your real life, Joel, with a son. That's a good question. That's a good question. The Good Doctor, that just to be clear, that's the name of the show, The Good Doctor, on uh, Monday nights, I think it's NBC or something. Um, you know, I mean, it's a contentious topic, like everything in the autism community. It's it's constantly being debated, and def- there's and I can't even wade into it. But, I mean, I'm going to stick to your question, because I think that might be the, the simplest. I mean, there are things that I recognize. This is an actor playing someone with autism. It's not an autistic person um acting it's it's and i'm I'm sure in five years that will be considered taboo but for now it's still considered acceptable and i think he does a great job and um you know there's he captures certain nuances but i mean it's it's a network show so 
it's it's dealing with um, it's a bit cheesy. It's dealing with kind of broad storylines, good and evil, not evil, but you know, it's got a bit of melodrama to it. But what I like about it, and not to go over the cliff on on talking about this one show, but um, I was surprised because like like last night they kind of dealt with issues. I don't really watch network TV. I'm not sure that many people do anymore with what with Crave and Netflix and, you know, everybody's in their own little silo, right? Watching their own little playlist. But as a, as a broad network show that's designed for a big general audience, I find it interesting that they're tackling themes that I never would have seen 10 years ago and not, not just autism itself, but, you know, cause the storyline right now is that the Dr. Sean is, he's, um, engaged, he's engaged and his wife to be is pregnant. So he's going to be a father. And that's, you know, that's a fairly predictable thing for TV, uh, an hour long drama to, to tackle, but they kind of, they kind of, they're dealing with themes about what is masculinity in 2021 and, and what are the gender boundaries and the stereotypes. And they're doing it in a way that I think is actually very interesting because it's not stuff that I'm, would have associated with network TV. And it's not stuff I would see on cable or Netflix necessarily, where everything's kind of got that, you know, that edge, right? Everything's really edgy and it's making an assumption on the, by the audience that they're, they're, they're cool, right? They're, they're down with it. But um, no, I found, um, yeah. I mean, I just think it's an interesting show because you can only do so much with the, with Dr. Sean has autism. They kind of dealt with that in the first season. So now they're kind of going off and, interesting directions and they've gotten to some interesting intriguing areas i mean things it's such an interesting time to be alive right now because all the social mores we grew up with are changing like they're all they're all changing i mean in front of our eyes like with black lives matter and gender equality and all that kind of stuff is is being talked about in a way now that it never was before and i think it's it's really interesting and my kids are the beneficiaries of that i have an 11 and a 12 year old son and they're going to grow up they're gonna it's interesting to me because i'm literally 50 years older than my youngest son and the world i grew up in so i can compare at any given moment where he is and what it was like when i was 11 and it's so vastly different Different and i think better now so it's it's just very interesting to me what's beautiful is that their media that they're going to grow up with yeah it's going to be inclusive so it's not going to be a question of this is different or um, you know, there's not going to be a question of representation. It's already happening in what they're seeing and what they're intaking. Yeah. It, like in 19, the 1970s, when I was in grade five and six which, and seven, which my kids are now, you know, if you were different, if you had a disability, if you not were cool racialized, mm-hmm. if you were from another, like anything, you'd be targeted immediately and no one would, would step in to help you. You were just, and that would scar you for life and, no one thought twice about it. And, you know, um, that does, I know it's, it's far from perfect now, but it's much different now. And um, changes are happening. Yeah. Hey, Joel, uh, I've been writing for almost 20 years now. And every article I've written as a freelance writer, I've kept and I photocopied and put in a binder. So we're talking like over a thousand stories that I can look at. And I sometimes go back and I look at them and I learn things about my writing and myself um, your body of work that you've created over all these years, are you able to look at in any way or is it just scattered across? And, and maybe a lot of it's gone forever. Like, uh, is your body of work out there for you to look at if you want to take a journey through the past? Yeah, it is, actually it is because I'm as an arts writer and a columnist doing that kind of personal critical writing from the beginning. I always had more of an, I feel like an emotional investment in it than I would have had had I been doing straight news where it's just the facts, ma'am. And I, I would, you know, I've done some of that as well. And I don't bother keeping that stuff because it's, you know, it's to me, to me, it's, well, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say, say, say one of those moments we were talking about, but I'm covering a council meeting and Mm -hmm. the way I would do it, I'm not saying like we have brilliant writers on the record. I'm not, this is, but when I would be forced to cover city council or a school or it was stenography to me. I would mm-hmm. be taking notes and I'd be writing them down. He said, she said, and I had no emotional investment in these stories and I found them tedious and emotionally draining. And I would never keep them because I had no interest in even reading them, but stuff where I'm writing about my life or, um, you know, things with a critical voice. Yeah. So I actually have scrapbooks from 1987, which is the first year I started, 
I got my full, actually going back to 1985, when I started writing for the, as a freelance film critic for the Toronto star, and then my first full-time job, the London free press in 1987. And I kept scrapbooks diligently all the way, probably up till about 93, 94. And then it just started getting, I got further and further behind. They started piling up. And what I, and then I, I had a number of years where I just had stacks of newspapers. And then what I've finally done, because I've kept most of the stuff that I cared about, is I just kind of, um, now I have these, these um, bins. I've got them all chronologically in bins. I'm not doing the scrapbook thing anymore. But if I hadn't kept physical copies, you're right, they'd be gone. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they don't, you know, on the internet, they're here today, gone tomorrow. And good luck tracking something down if you want to show your kids in 10 years or something. So yeah. I swear I wrote this stuff for the record. I swear. <laughs> well, you, mentioned, yeah. you mentioned taking notes. I once saw your notebook when you're taking notes. So what, what is that, that you're writing down? What I'm saying is nobody would ever be able to read that, 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 <laughs> and I, I'm not exaggerating here. It is just little scribbles. Like it's like, it's another, like it's Klingon or something. So yeah. what, what is it you're doing there? Because there is no way anybody could look at that. And decipher right. words. Words. Right. Right? That's interesting. So you remember when did you see my notebook? This is like twenty five years ago. Or Marshall not? has a very uh, <laughs> photographic memory. Yeah, we were somewhere. It was you, you, me, and Colin Hunter standing around somewhere for a long time in a lineup. I can't remember where we were. Interesting. And uh, anyways, I saw you working for a bit, and I looked over your shoulder, and I was like, "Yeah, what the heck is he? Is that is he writing? It's, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's it's not words. It really isn't at all. No. What is, what is it? Um. Well, it's chicken scratch. I mean. I do my best to, um, you know, your ear picks up on key phrases that you think that just jump out when you're talking to somebody. And I try to, as best as I can, to get those down verbatim. And the rest of the time, your your brain, I don't know, the way my brain works, I'm just, write, I'm just kind of writing down what people say, but then it leaps to attention when something good comes out. And then I'll try and get all the words, but the rest of it, yeah, it's probably a mishmash. But what I try to get mostly is... Um, the impressions and the color behind it and the situation I'm in, because I'll never remember that stuff later. I can always double check a quote later, which I often do if it's incomplete or if I missed a word or something, um, you know, cause I've written, I've done interviews with you and, you know, we do a lot of email stuff back and forth and I'll do follow-up questions. I'll drive people crazy, but you know what? They're always happy when it comes out and I don't misquote them. Because I'm, I'll get back to them four or five times if I have to make sure if I don't understand it, I'm not putting it in the newspaper. And if it doesn't make sense, you don't want it in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, the way people speak, if you transcribe that literally and put it in the paper, it wouldn't make any sense and no one would read it anyways. So it, it's really your ear. It, it, it's about capturing the spirit and, and taking out all the excess verbiage. And so I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really have a good... My note taping, my note taking is atrocious. I mean, I'm going to be honest about that, but I found ways to compensate. And I don't like using a tape recorder because it takes way too long to transcribe anything. And the short answer is that's just your handwriting. Yeah, it's always been. <laughs> and, very... and, and Joel, and you can decipher like letters in that, in those marks. No, I, I'm not joking. <laughs> okay. Because I, I don't okay. see anything that looks like uh, the, the English language. You're right. So what, what will happen is if I don't sit down with it the same day, when my brain will often fill in the blanks and I can decipher things, it I have to. It gets harder and harder the more time passes. So I try to sit down with it the same day or the early the next day. And but I'll have to sit there and I'll have to reimagine myself in the situation and the the tenor of the conversation, what the topic was, and then I can usually remember most of the stuff. That but you're right, it, it's challenging and it's actually the part I hate the most because it'd be great to have like a translator walking around with me, taking all the notes or, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, just something where that's the part of the job that is the drudgery and trying to transcribe things, whether you're doing it on a tape recorder or trying to decipher unreadable notes, it's challenging, but you got to do it well, because if you don't, you're going to get, you know, people are going to say, well, I didn't say that, or you misquoted me. I, I fortunately have not had that because I've, like I said, I found ways to compensate, but yes, a lot of my notes are unreadable and I'm it's a, it's a challenge. So <laughs> Joel, what have you learned from guys like Matt McCarthy and Colin Hunter? When the three of you were there at the same time, when Colin was there, I, I saw you guys kind of like as the, the Mount Rushmore of the Waterloo region record. You're just 
all stel- <laughs> stellar heavy at, hitters at your craft. Um, what have you learned from those two? I know, oh, I, I, know, I know Colin left a long time ago, but and, and Tony Reinhardt also. I mean, yeah, yeah, keep talking Steve, about them and Steve Cannon before that. I don't know if you remember Steve Cannon, but um, now these these are people that are artists, I would say, and and I appreciate you lumping me in with them. Like Matt is an artist, and he doesn't just take photos; he creates art. Like he he captures the essence of something, and um, he does it in a way that nobody else could do exactly the same way, which to me is the secret to, to art. And you're an artist, Marshall, so I'm sure you can, you know, you have your own take on that as well. But Colin as well, he, he's kind of like he's, it's about the artist, the an ear for language and artistry and knowing how to put words together to get a certain emotional effect. I mean, it's kind of a lost art, to be honest. I don't see a lot of that anymore in in, in b- the beleaguered world of journalism today. But I mean, you know, it, it, it still exists. Um, it, but it's, yeah, I, I appreciate the compliment. It's, um, it's people who care about writing it's, and, and people in and, and Matt's case about, about the art of photography. Like he's not just taking a, you know, it's not like a phone book. <laughs> like he's not taking a picture of a phone book. He's, he's capturing the essence of something. Mm-hmm. I think that's the, the, the secret to good writing too, is you're capturing the essence. You're kind of giving a sense the feeling of what it's like to interview this person or a feeling of what it's like to be somewhere. I mean, they always say show, don't tell. And I think, I think that's the rule that, that should be the rule for, you know, good, that, that, for good writing for me. Good one for parenting too. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So we're kind of talking about some days gone by here, but are you missing office culture? So you're at home. Everyone's at home now. April, as of April 30th, it's no longer the record. It is, it's been closed permanently since the pandemic started. So um, I've been up there a couple of times to get stuff like everybody else, but yeah, it's a passing of an era. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm just, I just wrote a story about this It'll probably in the next few days, but I mean, I was never made for office life in the first place. So while I feel bittersweet about the passing of an era, and I think it was a meaningful landmark for the, for the community, um, you know, the record, the positive note is the record it, itself still exists it, it's just gonna not have a building and and thankfully all the reporters and staff are still working you know like mm-hmm. we, we all kept our jobs and but i mean i i was never somebody who was gonna fit into office culture in the first place i you know i was always complaining about the sluggish airflow and you know there's too much sunlight coming in this window and <laughs> this person's clearing their throat i mean i was not i i've always been better just off of my own in a corner somewhere, not bothering anybody. And, you know, um, you know, I hear, I'd be you. Stir- I hear you, Joel. I'd be stirring up mutinies by the coffee machine because the creamer creamer was, you know, past its expiry date. And, you know, I, if anybody ever deserved to be banned from the office, it was probably me. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I, I miss my colleagues, you know, I mean, I'd be happy yeah. to go meet them at Tim Hortons or something and we can all, but um, yeah, I'm, you know, I, 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 I was unmanageable as an employee anyway. So I don't feel like whatever contribution I was making to the office culture per se was probably in, in a negative impact anyway. So I'd rather just write my stories. <laughs> so, yeah. I, uh, I was recently talking to somebody who's just uh, retired in the last year, actually retired just in time for the pandemic. So had all these big plans to travel and, you know, buy a boat and get out there and do life things. And, you know, the pandemic has slowed these things, but he tells this one story about a day in the office where a man in the bathroom stall was eating an apple while he was washing his hands. <laughs> so this person, this retiree was washing his hands and someone was just having their lunch in the stall. I don't know if they would, were do- doing double duty there, but um, th- these are the types of things I will never miss about an office. Oh, and the awkward <laughs> small talk. How was your weekend? Great. And I make it too. I also make the awkward small talk because you have to (laughs) reciprocate. You can't just be the asshole. That's like my weekend was fine. Here's all the things I did now down to business. Like you have to reciprocate and and show an interest. Oh yeah. I have this other problem where I, people I've been, I've met like 30, 32 years ago. I can't remember like their support staff or whatever people you don't see. They're not reporters, but people work in the building. I can't remember their names and mm-hmm. you can't ask them. You can't ask them their name after 32 years, <laughs> no, you but, can't. but it's awkward, right? Yeah, yeah. They know your name. So like, it's just, I can't, it's just very stressful for me to be in that environment. 
I have a stress, like I have an anxiety thing about names anyway, where like, I know your name is Joel. I've met you online and I've met you in person, quote unquote, in person. But next time that we run into each other out in the world, I might be like, I think his name's Joel, but maybe it's Noel or maybe it's Noah or maybe it's Jonah. <laughs> and I get very nervous. Marshall's witnessed this before. I get really nervous with last name. So I have this trick where I, I introduce my husband and say, oh, Steve, have, have you guys met or have you met my husband, Steve here? <laughs> you know, and, and well, let good. them take care of it because yeah. I just get nervous and it, I don't know what that it's a tick of some kind, but. And Joel, your, your, your picture has been in the paper for decades now. Um, are, yeah. you, are you okay with the strangers coming up and chatting with you and yeah, telling. you get that a lot Marshall yeah yeah Joel more consistently though with that photo like I mean you well, must get people coming up and talking to you all the time well it's interesting that you mentioned that first of all a lot of people um even now after 32 years at the record call me Jeff they think my name is Jeff I get oh, emails they're, they're, Jeff. They're, they're shortening you know with the ribbon off I, I don't so know are, are we not are we not are we not talking with Jeff outset right now <laughs> <laughs> like, like Jeff Jeff but um, no, it's interesting how it's morphed over the years. Um, and I don't, I know where, I don't know. Do we have time to, for me to answer this? We question? have all yeah. kinds of time. Oh, good. Cause um, I mean, in the early days, I started at the very tail end of the golden age of journalism when expense accounts were unlimited. I had a company car, uh, Christmas bonuses, mm-hmm. lunches on the company dime. Sounds I'd yummy. Walk, and you had a mullet and you had a mullet too. I had a mullet. People would read <laughs> people. This was actually the London Free Press, and I was there for in 87, 88. People would read the newspaper, not just not just people over over 50 or 60, like now, like everybody would read the newspaper. I'd walk into a shoe store. You're Joel Rubinoff. You wrote that review of, of the vile tones on Saturday in the paper. That was a great review, blah, blah, blah. And I go in the swimming pool. Hey, you're Joel. And it was like, honestly, it was like you were some kind of celebrity or something. And, you know, my ego was very healthy at that point. And I had this exaggerated sense. Well, I shouldn't say that because it was already exaggerated, but it maintained that kind of sense of invincibility that I had gained from university. And Joel, you would have fit in with uh, much music. You you could easily fit fit in being on much music at that time. But what has happened with you is it's been a steady but slow erosion of recognizability as the demographics for newspaper readership have gone up. And the digital world has slowly encroached on that. And it's, it's much different now. Like the people who generally would recognize me now are people my age, maybe a little bit younger and, and older. And so it's, it's a much different world than it used to be in that, in that respect. Um, But yeah, no, sometimes I'll walk around, people will say, you know, and it's usually pleasant experience and I'm always happy to, you know, like there were times early on when I was reviewing um, like, rock and roll stuff at Lulu's Roadhouse or mm-hmm. or what was that bar in Cambridge it was like the rough it was kind of a rough coronet maybe or something I don't know if that was no that was like Victoria was there's yeah. another one that coronet Cambridge. was like Victoria North but it probably was there was one that had, one. had, had oh, there was one called Challenger that had the space shuttle on it yeah. <laughs> the manor maybe it was the manor I oh, can't yeah, remember the manor. I feel yeah, like that's Guelph of- and I'm embarrassed that I know that yeah. <laughs> There, there'd be these drunk guys that would come up and in their 20s. And I was probably a little bit older at that point. Hey, and Jeff. They'd say, <laughs> and they'd say, you wrote that review of so-and-so. And I like that show. And you panned it. I'm going to punch you in the nose. And it's like, there's a couple of times they threat, And you know, like, I, I talked them down and, and they, 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 they would back off. But yeah, so there pe- people would be really mad at, at some. But I found that was mostly with the rock and roll stuff. Movie stuff drew a different audience. TV stuff do, drew a different audience. And they would not physically threaten you. They would just disagree with you. But it was always respectful. So, <laughs> Joel, uh, you've seen so many people come and go over the years. You just mentioned a few there. Tony Reinhardt and uh, I think about Phil Bast and uh, Phil Walker. And some of these people have passed away now. And uh, how do you explain your longevity like over the years? Like you're still there. And so many people have come and gone now. And uh, you must have at times been looking over your shoulder with all the changes happening, being made and thought, you know, is there still a place for me? Even, even as revered as you are and respected over the years, you must at times thought, wow, I'm still here. eh?" I'm just very dogged. I mean, I just put my head down and because I'm, I'm a perfectionist and there's a strain of OCD in that as well. I mean, I just kind of focus really well on whatever I'm doing and then whatever I'm doing at that moment becomes the most important thing. And I don't, think beyond that. And I think probably in daily newspapers, most people, regardless of what they're writing, it's always about the next day, the next day. 
So I don't think there's a, I, I very rarely have, you know, I mean, when I look back, it, of course, it's like, wow, 32 years, but really it's day to day. It's like deadline, deadline, deadline. And so, you know, I mean, I'm, I like what I'm doing and it's, I know it's kind of my, my thing that I, you know, that I was am able to do, but yeah, I don't, um, you know, there, it is a pretty tempestuous environment right now with all the changes. It's been that way in all honesty for about 10 years. It's probably a little more intense right now, but journalism has been um, in a slow but steady decline almost since the early 90s, I would say, when the recession hit. And at that point, they started taking things away like no more Christmas party, no more expense account, no more company car. All those things went out the window one after another in the early 90s, never came back. So it's always been that kind of, you know, just keep your head down, do what you do and and hope that you make it to another day. And it's, you know, here I am and it's 2021. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it looks like journalism will survive. I'm not a prognosticator. I don't have a crystal ball. But given the number of people that were, that were pronouncing it dead, dead, like probably 15 or 20 years ago, I mean, it, it's changed a lot and it's not what it, and, it, you know, definitely it's been reduced in its ability in the, in, in its scope in the sense of, we don't have the financial resources, blah, 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 digital encroachment and so on and so forth. But I mean, we're still here. We're still, we're still doing the same job every day. And I don't, you know, I, I'd be, I'd be surprised if that, if there was a day that came when, you know, newspapers in general ceased to exist. Now, having said that the Guelph Mercury went out of business five years ago, so it's not like it's, and a lot of other newspapers as well. Um, so yeah, you don't really know. I, I think I got off track with your original question. That's okay. I was going to ask if, uh, you know, if you if you can wrap up your career on your own terms, you know, years from now, hopefully, not not. I'm, what I mean is like far away, not too They've soon. They've got two young kids. It can't be yeah. too soon. Um, do you can can you imagine like one final article, one final column, and how you'd like to? I love that when you can see a a writer kind of put a put their whole career in a box and put a bow on it and write this amazing farewell column. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you know, oftentimes that's not an option. Sometimes, you know, you're told the day that, that you're done. Yeah. Mo like, it's funny. Cause I was thinking that too. Most of the pe the writers I respect in the arts field and columnists and whatever, they all get turfed out in their ass without any warning at the end of the day. It, it's, it's really about, you know, what have you done for me lately? And, and what do you got for tomorrow? It's the nature of the beast. I don't, you know, I think in another era that was possible where uh, a celebrated columnist like Gary Lawton's at the Toronto Star, or Ron Bass, a uh, movie critic at the Toronto Star, they would do, or maybe John Kiley at the record um, when he left uh, maybe 25 years ago, whatever it was, um, could do a big, you know, celebratory, fond reminiscence about their career. I haven't seen much of that in the last 20 years, to be honest. Usually it's like you're just terminated and then you're out in the street. Or often in the case of arts writers, I've noticed not at our paper, but but at people I've looked up to at other papers, usually they get because arts writers and columnists, Marshall, you, you I mean, you probably have seen this yourself and they tend to have strong opinions. They're opinionated people. They're maybe not the easiest people to get along with. And I would include myself in that group because they're opinionated and they have passionate opinions and they want to express themselves. Maybe they're not the easiest people to manage. Maybe they get into conflicts occasionally over you know, columns or their opinions, and maybe they end up turfed out on their, on their butts on the street. I mean, I've seen that a number of times, like, you know, um, <laughs> it seems to be a, a, almost like a requisite ending to the career of, 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 of a columnist that has a kind of a, you know, a backbone is that they're going to end up at some point being turfed out on their butt. And that's going to be the end of the end of their career. So, you know, I don't, I don't have any illusions about that. I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing and I hope it lasts and continues. And when that fateful day comes, I will, you know, be grateful for the time I've had. Hey all, thanks for meeting us in Bond Park please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung.